Are you pregnant and alone? You have options. The Sanctuary of Hope offers expectant mothers ages 12 to 22 a place to live, medical care, counseling, continued education, and options to raise your baby in a loving environment or help you with adoption. We want to help provide you and your baby with a bright future. Call us or email us today and let's walk through this together. 210-499-1554 or SOHcares.org. All inquiries are confidential. The Dear Agency specializes in helping you understand your coverage before you need it. We offer all lines of personal and commercial insurance, including auto, home, and life. Contact Don Deere at 210-507-2169 and visit us at 7529 North Loop 1604 in Live Oak, Texas or FarmersAgent.com slash DDeer. Listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again with an amazing show for y'all today. Today, we're going to be talking to a Grammy nominated songwriter, worship leader, singer, producer, Michael Dixon. He is from Houston, Texas. He has a powerhouse story. And man, with all this craziness going on with COVID-19, we're going to have an exclusive story from him talking about how he beat it. And with no further ado, I just want to welcome Michael to the show and say, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good. How are you? Doing great, man. So before we get to the the story of COVID-19 and how you faced it and, and overcame it, Tell the audience just a little bit about yourself real quick. Uh, well, as you said, I'm from Houston. Um, I didn't grow up in church, um, but I found God um, at 19, uh, and that kind of changed my life path. I uh, got into music and uh, became a worship leader and then put out some music, and now we're here. <laughs> and you put out some good music to be Grammy nominated, so... <laughs> what what were some of the inspirations that you pulled from in your music career? Uh, my biggest inspirations, um, they're little, um, they, they kind of span genres. Uh, Missy Elliott is a huge inspiration for me. And then Kirk Franklin, those are like my two biggest inspirations. Um, and they really kind of guided me musically. And I grew up on like old R&B. My mom used to always listen to Earth, Wind & Fire. Uh, Whitney, Luther, and MJ. Those were like, that was the music of my childhood. And when you dig into the creative times of of being in the studio, working on your craft, when you're working on your projects, what are some of the things that you do to keep yourself focused on the task at hand? Because some people have certain perks of what they do. What do you do to keep yourself focused during projects? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I I try not to um, listen to what's currently out um, because it, it kind of brings me to a place of comparison. Um, and then that just starts to, like, throw me off completely. Um, I try to stay um, kind of closed off musically. Um, to where all that I'm focusing on is what I'm currently doing um, so I don't get distracted by what's happening and what's out. As a successful artist in the music industry, so many people are trying to get in the industry, if you will. What, because you, you talk about the situations of sometimes some people can find themselves comparing themselves to other people. How do you keep yourself grounded where you're not allowing yourself to try to be like somebody else other than you? Like, how do you keep yourself to be original? Uh, That's a great question. Um, It took me a while to get to that place. Um, I had to figure out that um, what I had or what I have is uniquely me. 
Like nobody else can do what I do. Um, so instead of trying to do what other people do and not be as well versed in someone else's lane, um, I learned to kind of carve out my own lane and rock in that because I'm truly the best when I'm doing when I'm doing me. Like trying to be someone else is very difficult um, because they were created to be that person and I wasn't created to be that person. So kind of locking in this lane that I created, um, it, it helps me stay focused. It helps me stay grounded. Um, and it also helps me with that comparison piece. Um, helps me not to compare to someone else and just stay focused on my lane. And we're talking to music artist Michael Dixon. He is a singer, songwriter, Grammy nominated songwriter. I got to put that in there. And <laughs> just overall, just, man, I, I don't want to say Superman, but you did beat this this thing that's going on around here. And I'm just going to use that to trans, transition to what's going on with COVID-19. Tell us, like, take us back how... Like, just tell us the story from the from the beginning. Like, what was going on? How did you know that something wasn't right? And just kind of take us through that process. Yeah, so um, I have dates in my calendar because I was keeping track of my symptoms. Um, so on the 12th of March, um, I woke up with a fever. Um, and I'm assuming just out the blue that I contracted this that week, uh, cause that week is when, uh, we were kind of panicking in Houston cause we thought that they were going to shut down the city. So everyone was rushing to the grocery store to get supplies and stuff. And I was one of those people. So I'm assuming that's how I contracted it. But on, uh, March the 12th, I woke up with a fever, um, so I went out to find a thermometer because uh, I remember reading that if your temperature is 100.6, um, then that's a sign of COVID. Uh, so I went out to find a thermometer. I could not find one anywhere. I went to a dozen stores. Thermometers were sold out. I looked online. They were sold out. So I was kind of panicking because I wanted to know what my temperature was. Uh, I probably shouldn't have went outside as well. (laughs) Um, But had the fever on the 12th, 13th, still had the fever. Um, The next day, I still had the fever. Um, And so one of my friends told me that she had a thermometer, so she brought it over to me. So on the 15th, I was able to actually check my temperature. Um, and at that time it was 101. Um, so, and mind you, this is a fourth day of having a fever straight. Um, I, I've never had a fever in my adult life, so it was kind of new to me. I'm sure I had it as a child, but I don't remember that. Um, so it was 101 on the 15th. Um, and then I found a hotline here in Houston that you can call to get tested. So I called the the hotline number, told the lady my symptom, and she told me, well, at this time, we can't test you, but assume that you have it and quarantine yourself for 14 days. Um, I didn't like that answer because I really wanted to get a test. Uh, So the following day, that Monday on the 16th, I called the hotline again. Someone else answered. And so I just lied. I told him I had pre-existing condition, um, and I came into contact with someone who tested positive. And right away, the the guy on the line gave me this 12-digit number and told me to go to this location for drive-through testing. Wow! So you wow? Because <laughs> here's the thing: I, I just want to paint this for the audience. You you literally had it, and you were fighting through this thing, and. <laughs> you had to make adjustments to actually get some treatment. That's crazy. Yeah, I had to lie. And the thing is, like, I I contracted the virus kind of early and Mm -hmm. in this whole pandemic, at least in the U.S. So there was so much unknown about it. 
which I'll get into with my symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the 16th, I went to the drive through testing, and it was the most uncomfortable test I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, they take a cotton swab, and they stick it up your nose, your nostril, as far as they can go. <laughs> and they, like, dig around both nostrils. It was super uncomfortable, super painful. Felt like it lasted for minutes. It was only like 10 seconds. <laughs> wow. Um, so did the test. They gave me like a, a little pamphlet uh, letting me know if I test positive, um, what what the, the next steps are. Uh, they said because I've gotten tested, self-quarantine yourself, stay away from people, don't go outside, all of that stuff. Um, so, um, that was on Monday, the 16th, on the 17th, still have the fever and, um, I'm taking medication to kind of combat the symptoms of the fever. So, you know, you got the body aches, the headaches, um, all of that stuff. I was taking ibuprofen and have been taking that since the fever started. Um, so around the 18th is when a lot of articles started coming out about, um, ibuprofen and other insects that you shouldn't take those because they will make the virus worse. So remember, I'm kind of at the beginning of the pandemic. So there's a lot that's unknown. Yeah. So now I'm kind of tripping because this is really the only medication I've been taking. There's new information is coming through every day. <laughs> right. <laughs> so now I'm like, oh, Lord, what's about to happen? Um, so I still have the fever. Uh, the ibuprofen was helping with, like, the body aches and stuff. But now um, on the the 18th, I start experiencing loss of taste. But, of course, this was – there was nothing out there about loss of taste mm-hmm. being a part of this. So I'm like – well, maybe this is like a symptom of fever. Um, and since I've had a fever for so long, maybe that's what that is. Um, I didn't find anything to support that. So I was like, okay. So loss of taste was really strange. Uh, it really made me just not want to eat because nothing had a taste. It was really interesting. Um, so now I'm dealing with the fever and the loss of taste. Um, on the 19th, I finally get my test results. Um, they come back positive. Um, and the lady on the line told me, uh, you know, from this day, quarantine yourself for 14 days. After the 14th day, you need to be symptom-free without medicated help for three days. Um, so that clock started on the 19th. On the 20th, still have the fever and still have the loss of taste. But these are the only symptoms that I'm dealing with. The night of the 20th, it was like around 7 or 8 o'clock at night. My fever breaks, but I start to deal with a plethora of symptoms. They all just kind of hit at once. Uh, so I started having the, the, the dry cough, the consistent dry cough, um, and uh, then start having digestive issues, uh, so diarrhea, vomiting, um, start dealing with that. Um, and then around 2 in the morning, the the shortness of breath kicked in. And that was, like, the scariest thing I've ever experienced. Um, It was literally, if I would move, I couldn't catch my breath. And so I immediately called 911, um, told them that I tested positive. Um, The operator asked if I was able to meet the EMTs outside. Um, I told her I could. Uh, so I go outside, and um, the EMTs show up, and they throw the surgical mask at me because um, I didn't have any gloves or masks. 
Because mm-hmm. once I caught it, I stayed inside, so I didn't get those types of surprise. Yeah, it's not like you can um, just go to the store and, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they, um, they literally throw these masks at me, which I'm grateful because I needed the mask. Um, and the, one of the MT guys, uh, once I put on the mask, he came and um, checked my breathing uh, with the stethoscope. So he checked my lungs. Um, and he said my lungs were clear. Um, and then he, he said something that I don't know why it didn't click until he said it. Um, but he was like, um, you know, shortness of breath is actually a symptom of this. Um, so this is like something that you don't have to go through <laughs> pretty much. Um, and that kind of gave me comfort. Um, but it was like right now it, it's like, you're good right now. Uh, your lungs sound good and your breathing is not bad. But if it gets worse, you know, please call us again. We can take you to the hospital now, but they'll more than likely discharge you because your symptoms aren't severe. So I was like, well, let's not even go through that. And yeah, so let's, they, not even, um, let's not even try to find out. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, and I was also kind of, kind of scared to go to the hospital in general because I, I had a, I have a fear of being intubated. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was trying to avoid the hospital at all costs. Um, so the EMTs left and they said, if you need anything, you can just call 911 again. I was like, great. Um, got back inside and had to walk up the stairs to my room and had to take a break <laughs> in the middle of the stairs just to catch my breath. Wow. And by the way, um, uh, for the audience, this guy is a young man. He's he's not up in age, so for him to have to take a break going up the stairs, this is serious. Yeah, I'm I'm 33, um, and I'm I'm an active person, so <laughs> mm-hmm. that was that was very different. Um, but in the back of my head, I'm remembering the AMT saying like, "This is a symptom. Like, you know, symptoms go away eventually." So that's just what I keep thinking. Um, But the next two days, it was really rough. Um, Anytime I would cough, um, it would take me a while to catch my breath. Um, Anytime I would move a certain way or um, walk into the restroom, I would always have to take a break to catch my breath. And so that that was uh, that was scary, um, and I'm still dealing with the the, the 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 stomach issues. So I'm having to go to the restroom a lot. Um, and then on where are we at on the 30th of March, um, that was a Sunday. I woke up and uh, stomach issues were gone. Um, The shortness of breath was still kind of there, but it wasn't as bad as it was. Um, And I was still dealing with the cough. But now when I would cough, uh, mucus would come up and there would be blood in the mucus. So I had no idea what that was. (laughs) Um... So I Googled it, which probably shouldn't have done because, you know, Google will Oh, yeah, it'll give you a, a horrible <laughs> sentence, man. It gives you the worst. Uh, but the first thing that it did show was that that was a symptom of pneumonia, um, which if you haven't been following this whole COVID thing, um, when people get pneumonia, that's when it starts to turn to death. So now I'm like, all right, what what's going on here? Um, so I, I called my mom, who had kind of been, she's been my rock to this whole thing. She brought me food, brought me supplies, anything I needed. She was bringing it. So I called her and let her know that this was happening. Um, and she was like, uh, well, try to call your doctor. Um, so I called my PCP, um, well, I called the office. Um, to see, like, what I needed to do. Um, they pretty much 
told me, you know, if you feel your symptoms are bad, call 911. Yeah. Um, there was nothing that they could do. Um, so I, I gave it a day. Um, the following day, um, there was still blood in my mucus, but it, it wasn't. Um, it didn't happen every time I coughed. And the blood was only in my mucus. It wasn't like lingering in my mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, I thought that was a good thing. Um, the following day, um, it just, it kind of lessened itself each day. Um, but I still wanted to go to the doctor to kind of get a chest x-ray to make sure, you know, there's not pneumonia or anything. Cause mind you, I didn't get any type of medication. So I didn't have any antibiotics, none of that. Um, cause my actual doctor, uh, he wouldn't see me. I couldn't even go into the office and they didn't have the whole tele telephone conferences or whatever that they're doing now. They didn't have that then. Um, so I was just kind of in this by myself. <laughs> um, but by April 1st, um, all of my symptoms had gone away. Um, I had nothing, so my countdown for the three days without symptoms started. Um, and now we are some 15 days later, 16 days later, and I have not experienced any symptoms. Um, finally, here in Houston, they have opened up testing to where anyone can get a test, no questions asked. Uh, So on Monday of this week, I went and got a second test. Um, And for those who may not know, they were not, and I don't know if they're doing this in other cities or not, uh, but they were refusing to give people second tests. Hmm. Um, So it's just kind of like you have to assume that after this quarantine period that you no longer have the virus. Wow. Which to me doesn't make sense, and right. I feel like that would help the spread of this virus. Yeah, but I think now that states are finally getting more tests, or well, at least in Houston or Texas, they are, they're able to test you a second time. So now I'm waiting on the results from that to know for sure that I'm done with this thing. So that's interesting. So you don't even know if you possibly may still. Have it some way, some way, somehow. I don't. Um, That's crazy. A, a few days ago, the health department called me mm-hmm. um, to get like demographic information and to see who I had been in contact with. And I have two roommates. Um, they both tested negative, uh, so we did a really good job at staying sanitized. So you stay in the bathroom but, the whole uh, time. <laughs> 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 Pretty much, <laughs> but um, I talked to the, someone from the health department, and I asked them a bunch of questions. I asked them, um, "Could I get a second test?" And she told me at this time, uh, "No, just adhere to the CDC guidelines of quarantine." And I was like, "Well, can I get this again?" Mm-hmm. And she was like, "Well, we don't know at this time." Um, but if you feel any symptoms, just self quarantine yourself. Um, I asked if they if they know if there are different strands of this. Like, are there more aggressive strands? Are we dealing with one thing? No answer. Um, but they had no answers to any of my questions, which was not reassuring at all. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I can't imagine the stress that puts you in because. You're you're definitely not living a normal life. You can't go nowhere. And how how have you been able to? Because I know you, you say your mom's been helping you. Is she like her and some other people being able to help? You know, get you through this. Like how are you? Because I'm I'm just thinking like, man, number one, you're not being able to live your normal life. Like I mean, mm-hmm. everyone's doing social distancing right now, but at the same time. You just can't do what other people can do, like go to the grocery store and get food and all that mm-hmm. stuff. So how are you keeping yourself <laughs> like just above water with your mind? Yeah, um, 
my mom and uh, my friends really came through for me. I had a lot of friends who um, sent me groceries through like uh, Amazon and like the delivery services. Um, and that, that was a tremendous help. Um, and my mom has been cooking every day and bringing food, leaving it on my doorstep. Um, but I'm also worried about her, um, because she, I have some great aunts that live here in the city and she's helping them out as well. So if they need groceries, she's going to the store, getting it for them. Um, so I'm, I'm always worried about her. She protects herself very well. Uh, but still worried about her being out in this. Um, but I've, I've, I've had a lot of assistance, um, from from friends, from family, from church members, um, and 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 the delivery services have been like heaven sent, like DoorDash and Uber Eats and Amazon. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're, that that stuff is is very essential at a time like this. And even at this point in time. You're you're basically symptom free. You just don't know if you may be carrying it still. Right, um, and and it's kind of given me this whole situation has kind of get it, it's given me like a bit of PTSD. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I have not been out of my house for a while, for over a month. Yeah, that's crazy. I, the only time I've gone outside was to get tested. And pick um, up your food. Than that. <laughs> That's on the porch. <laughs> right. And to open my door to pick up a bag. Um, but I have not been outside and I'm I'm not anxious to go outside. Mm-hmm. I I don't want to go outside and when I hear that, you know, the governors and presidents want to reopen the the states and the cities, um, it gives me anxiety because there's still so much unknown about this virus mm-hmm. that if we we move too soon, this thing is going to spread like wildfire. That's definitely understandable because, I mean, in, in your case, you're wondering in your mind, well, shoot, can I catch this another two, you know, round two? Like, Right. And, and, and you know, a lot of illnesses, when they come back, they come back aggressive. And I don't want no more of this. <laughs> But yeah, you have a solid point about this is so new that obviously no one really knows. You're almost the pioneer of them finding out how to like attack this thing because you're you're one of many who uh, had to go through this, and you're one you know the few, unfortunately, who you know not not a lot of people, uh, you know, there, there's some that survived, some that didn't survive. Um, just being careful yeah. what I say, you know, on, on the podcast. Yeah. But the point is, you're still one of the people that they will be leaning on as far as data is concerned. So yeah. you're actually <laughs> you're part of history, not to point any, you know, jokes or anything. But, like, you, you're really, you're helping the ones who are fighting this thing. You, you're you're going to be one of the data pe- uh, pieces that's going to help them with their research yeah. and that, that that was part of the reasons why i went public with it mm-hmm. um Bring and, and another is a lot of people are taking it seriously and i think me contracting this at least with my following um i think it kind of put one a face on it for a lot of people um and it, it kind of hit home for a lot of people yeah because uh, they directly knew someone who was going through it. And I tried to be as transparent as possible uh, with what I was dealing with symptom-wise and even the, the testing and, and all of that. Um, just tried to let people know, like, what's really going on and how people are really combating this thing. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm one of the blessed ones in the situation. And I, I thank God. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who have recovered, um, and some of those people now have medical issues that they didn't have before that they'll be dealing with for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that's the scary part because, once again, this is so new. 
and yeah. there's going to be research that's going to be done months from now and perhaps years from now and like for you to to get through this what, what would you say to anybody out there who might have a family member who might be going through this currently what would you tell them man it's going to be difficult um, especially if you're dealing with a family member who has it uh, one because you can't be in close contact with that person so it, it's going to be hard, man. Um, I would say, you know, if you if you don't know God, this is a good time to to, to get familiar with him. Um, he definitely helped me through this process. But um, what people going through this need is your strength um, because there's so much that we're going to go through mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, so we don't need you to be stressed out and worried. We just need your strength. Uh, so, so be strength for that family member that's going through this. Um, um, be hope for them. Uh, don't be negative. Um, everything should be positive because uh, we're we're having to deal with so much. Um, so, so try to be that person's strength. Um, uh, my heart goes out to to people who have lost family members. Um, so many people have lost people and they haven't been able to see them. They weren't able to see them through the process, um, because they were either quarantined self or quarantined in the hospital. Um, I've heard so many stories of family members passing and, um, the only way that they could contact them was through FaceTime or, or, or Zoom, um, Man, my heart goes out to those people because this, this is really rough. Think about trying to, you know, funeralize a family member during a pandemic. You can't have a funeral. <laughs> like, it, it, yeah. it's it's a lot, man. And I, I, I pray for, for anyone who's dealing with the death behind this. Um, I can only imagine what, what that feels like. How are you doing with the music world? Like, are you put on pause or are you finding creative ways to you know take your mind off of this stuff um so the the music piece um i have not uh gotten back into writing yet um luckily uh me and my team we recorded a lot of music at the end of last year um so we're we're gonna start rolling out some of that um so that'll kind of hold me until I kind of get my my juice back, um, but I, I haven't haven't I haven't dove back into it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little <laughs> a little weary. Um, one thing that a lot of people, when I went public with this, were commenting uh, was, you know, we can't wait to hear the music that comes out of you after <laughs> this, um, and that that's kind of. I mean, I appreciate it, um, but it, for me, it, it put a lot of pressure on me. So I'm trying to <laughs> to combat that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably <laughs> so right I'm, now. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm dealing with that. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what I was really asking if because uh, I know you're not recording vocals. I know that, but oh, no. <laughs> um, I was thinking if if any writing. Because you know how people say sometimes they dream about something and then they just write the lyrics out. <laughs> that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> and I, I, I have done that before, but yeah. none of that has happened. <laughs> yeah. No, that's understandable. But when when you see how all this is happening at once, like like we said earlier, it's, it's like it's a news story every single day. Mm -hmm. And it just... the the whole the whole story process just changes like from last week to this week everything's totally different and it mm -hmm. just keeps changing and changing and changing do you even like do you watch the news at all or do you like do you try to stay informed of what's happening and updates or are you just like man everything's on pause right now um while i was dealing with it um i didn't watch the news as much um, I would watch every now and then, and that's when I would see like new symptoms popping up that I've already dealt with. <laughs> um, but now, um, 
I try to watch as much as possible. Um, <laughs> like the press briefings from the White House, as ridiculous as they are, I do watch them. Um, but I try to steer away from when they start talking about the victims yeah. of COVID. Um, it's really sad, man. We're losing a lot of people when we shouldn't. What you're doing, I think, is very important. Bringing some awareness to people because you, you basically went through this thing, and it doesn't yeah. matter how severe it was or how severe it might have not been compared to other people. The point is, is that you had to go through it, and this is some good information. I think that people will definitely appreciate. What would you say to the listeners out there? Because just there's a lot of people who been affected, even though they haven't like had COVID-19. There's people who lost their jobs. There's people who have other mm-hmm. things, other circumstances. What would you say to people out there who are just, man, everything's just happening at once. What would you say to them to keep them moving, keep them not giving up in these tough times? Yeah, I definitely understand because um, I, I also lost my job at this time, so I get it. I think what's been keeping me is knowing that it gets better. Like, and I'm a witness. Like, I went through this, um, and it, it sucks to lose a job. Um, and the unemployment, the unemployment system is ridiculous. I, I, I know, I understand it. I know that you may seem hopeless, um, but there's hope. Like. We've, we've seen people survive just this virus. Um, you can make it through this this period. Like it's, it's not going to last forever. Um, so so just be hopeful. Um, try to surround yourself with positive things. Um, that's been my my biggest thing because um, I'm a worrier um, and I stress a lot. Um, but I've I've tried to stay positive in this time. Um, find a hobby, find a, a new habit that's a good habit. Um, try to keep your mind off of what you've lost um, and try to find some new things to gain. Um, and you may not gain financially, which, I mean, I get it. That, that, that's a hard thing to lose. Um, but try to fill your life up with some, some new things, some new energy, some new habits, some new hobbies. Um, don't let this time go to waste uh, with worry and stress. Like, I mean, we can't go nowhere anyway <laughs> at the yeah. moment. So, you know, find, find some positive things to do. Um, I know a lot of people are finally getting time to spend with their, their family. Um, cherish that. Because when once you have to go back to work, that that kind of dissipates. Mm-hmm. Cherish this 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 time away from everything. I heard so many times people saying everyone's lives will forever be changed because of this. But uh, yeah. keeping that mindset of get your priorities right, man. You know, like mm-hmm. you got to have the top priorities in place. And for you, what are some of your top priorities that you just have for yourself? as you're uh, going through all this? Well, one of my, my top priorities is to kind of enjoy moments after this. Mm. Um, I'm a very introverted person, so I, I kind of keep to myself. So th- this whole quarantine life is... You've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I have no issue with it. Yeah. Um, but I know that after this, I'm, I'm definitely going to to live life more. Um, to appreciate people more, um, to appreciate life more, because I literally could have been dead. Yeah. Um, and this really kind of opened my eyes to how I've been living life, um, kind of like a recluse, um, kind of to myself. Um, and I think it's it's kind of time for me to change that. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the biggest changes that for me that comes out of this. Um, And another big priority for me is to just release music. Um, I've been sitting on a lot of music because I've 
many reasons, insecurity, feeling like it's not good enough, feeling like it doesn't fit with what's going on in the industry, blah, 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 a bunch of stuff. Um, but I think after this, um, I'm just going to release music. Um, God has given me a lot of music, and I think people just need it. Like, it's not to, to make money. It's not to chart. Uh, I make music to help people, and I, I just need to release that stuff. Well, before we let you go, tell the audience how they can follow you on social media and where they can find your music. Uh, definitely. On all social media platforms, uh, you can find me at Mike Writes, that's M-I-K-E-W-R-I-T-E-Z. Uh, my music is available everywhere online. Uh, just search Michael Dixon, uh, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-D-I-X-O-N. Uh, the Walk on Water Project uh, is the project that I have out currently. Uh, and it's available everywhere. Well, there y'all have it. This is an exclusive. I almost feel like we did some breaking news there. But, man, we have <laughs> music artist, Grammy-nominated songwriter, worship leader, singer, and producer Michael Dixon from Houston, Texas. He he fought against COVID-19. And he, man, he survived it. So, Man, I hope things get better your way, and and man, prayers to everybody who who has to face this monster. Man, y'all can just you know put your faith in God and let Him take care of the rest. Yeah. So, man, thank you for being on the show and giving us your story. And man, man, it's like it's almost disbelief. Like, really, <laughs> man. Like, I don't even want to end the show because I'm still in disbelief. Like, man, tell me more. But I mean, we don't have, like, 10 hours, so I'm going to have to wrap this up. But before we let you go officially, though, what would you like to say to the audience? Like, anything you want to just put out there? I want people to realize that this virus is real. Um, I know there are a lot of different theories and thoughts from people, but this thing is real. And the scariest thing about this virus is there's no blueprint. The symptoms I went through, you may not experience. The symptoms you experience, I may not have experienced. There's no no blueprint for this virus. So there's no, the symptoms that I told you, it may not happen that way if you contract it. It may be completely different. So that I think for me, that's the scariest thing of this. Uh, protect yourself. Don't go out unless you absolutely have to. Um, Protect your family. Realize that this thing is real. If you're able to get tested in your city, if they're doing open testing, get tested just so you'll know because there are people who are carrying this virus who are asymptomatic and they're spreading it because they don't have no symptoms. So please get tested if you're able to. The test does not give you the virus for those who think that. <laughs> Go get tested, man. This, this thing is real. But there you have it, man. I think you need to have your own podcast show. But, uh, man, <laughs> just want to say thanks for taking time out of your schedule of Quentin Life to uh, talk to Henry Focus Radio. And let us know when you got some new music in the future, man. Whenever you get back in the game of releasing songs and stuff, hit us up Absolutely. so we can uh, chop it up and, and push that stuff, man. Absolutely. Appreciate y'all using your platform and sharing it with me. Truly appreciate it. Well, there you have it. That is Grammy-nominated songwriter and worship leader, singer, producer Michael Dixon of Houston, Texas. You can catch all our shows on honorarefocusradio.com. This show, man, like we say on every single episode, keep God first, stay focused, and peace. San Antonio? Need a barber? Visit our good friend, Rico Rodriguez, the owner of Rockefeller's Barbershop in San Antonio, Texas, 1733 Babcock Road, and book your appointment today by calling 210-782-5188.